I'd just like for us to welcome Alicia as she comes. I know she's got a word in season. It's really a day for words in season. So let's welcome Alicia. Thanks, Glenda. And I love that because both of my... Uh, both of my subjects have actually already been spoken about this morning, about family and about um, life. So I love that God is doing something um, and God is wants us to hear, to have our eyes open to what he's saying to us in his word. But um, let's pray, hey? Lord, I thank you that you are with us. And I thank you that you do have a word in season for each and every one of us here today or watching online. I thank you that we'll be open to hear what you are saying to us, to open to hear that revelation, whether it be um, whether it be a comfort or a challenge as well. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you're with us, your presence is here in Jesus' name. So today we are beginning uh, the series on We Are Family. So family is important, and I don't just think that, but God thinks that as well. So he designed family. He created us to be within a community, not just a nuclear family, um, but also family as a church family. And you know, all of our homes, they're so varied um, and the variety of personalities and characters is what makes a church, what makes Connect Church such a wonderful family. And we don't want everyone to be stock standard um, all, all, all robots doing the same thing. And God wants us to be joined together as well, together with our differences, our skills, our gifts, not just for us, but for the wider community that Glenda was talking about as well. But today I want to speak on the life-giving family, the life-giving home, <clears throat> not just in our physical houses, um, but us as life-givers, as the life-giving church as well. But first, I want to have a look at what I mean by life-giving home. So the meaning of life-giving is imparting or having the ability to impart life, vitality, invigorating or vitalizing. And the meaning of home is a place where something flourishes. It most typically is found, most typically found or from which it originates. Someone's or something's place of origin or the place where a person feels that they belong. And I just want to read a few scriptures as well. Um, as Rob was saying, that from the beginning of Genesis, we can read that God created the heavens and the earth. He created all life, animals, sea creatures, birds of the air. And we can read it in Genesis 1, 26 to 27. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the, the, fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, over the, all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. God created life. Not only... Um, all, not only all life on the earth, but he created us in his own image. God is life-giving. And from the beginning, he imparted life to us and he provided a home for Adam and Eve. And he actually wanted them to flourish, to belong. And God created a life-giving space for them. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I, being Jesus, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God is life-giving. And he wants us to live this life well. He wants, to live us, live it, he wants us to live it to the fullest that we can. He wants the best for us. Proverbs 24, verses 3 to 4, it says, By wisdom a house is built, and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. I've actually been reading this book. Uh, it's called Life-Giving Home by Sally Clarkson. Um, and she's a great woman of God, and she's got some terrific truths in her books. But in, it, uh, in part of it she states, uh, she states this, the idea of intentionally making my home a holding place for all that is beautiful, good, holy, and foundational to life 
a place where those I love always feel like they belong, a place of freedom and grace that launches them into the persons that they were made to be, a place of becoming. And she's intentionally created a space in her home that is life-giving. You know, how can we wisely build our homes, take intentional actions to create a space that is life-giving? I wanted to touch just very briefly, and at the end of the sermon, I want, want to go through it a bit deeper as well, but touch on what the Bible said about life-giving. Um, but I also want to give some practical ideas, or practical ways on how to be a life-giving family. And you know what? There are many people, there are many families that, you know what, are on the path who are life-giving and they've got the qualities of life-giving. But Sally Clarkson, in her book, she said, each of us belongs, each, sorry, each of us longs for a place to belong, a connection that gives roots to our wandering lives, our hearts hunger for a community where we, we, where we are intimate members, a sense of belonging to people who love us. Our souls crave a bigger purpose, crave, sorry, crave a bigger purpose than our jobs, a connection to a sense of meaning. We yearn to know all our stories have a significance in the grander scheme of God's mega story. And it was this last section that got me. All of these may be found in a home, a place to belong, a people to be a part of, and a purpose where God's righteousness and design are celebrated and cherished in the community every day. We all long for a place of community, a place to belong, and it's in our human nature that we search for the sense of purpose and meaning and how our story intersects with his story. But when I read that last um, sentence in the passage there, it reminded me of the four pillars of Connect Church, And um, the four pillars are that we are a loving family focused on helping our world love Christ, experience community, and to become equipped to live out our God-designed influence. Our aim at Connect Church is to cultivate that type of environment that produces a life-giving space, a place to be home, to be connected, that life-giving family. And we are trying to create this space that people um, feel that they've come home, a place of connection. And there are so many who don't have that place of refuge, that, that safe harbour for the wandering souls, a place where all is precious, that about life is preserved, that is protected, that it is cultivated. You know what? So that the daily needs of hearts and souls can be fulfilled. But we all need to be intentional about creating a life-giving space in our homes, in our church, in our hearts so that overflows from us. A life-giving family, a life-giving home doesn't just happen. And that's why we need to intentionally create um, habits and traditions to be aware of what we're inhaling in our lives that is this, is this helpful, is this life-giving when the kids were younger, I would actually ask them the question, usually when they were fighting, but is this helpful or is this harmful? And maybe I should get back to asking them that question, but isn't that a good, a good question to ask ourselves in situations? Is this helpful or is this harmful? Is this life-giving or is it tearing down? Are we exhaling the love of Christ the truth, are we creating a space around us that is helpful or harmful? You know, even this week I was having a, a moment with an unnamed child who may be very much like me, but, and I knew what I was speaking on today, and in my head I was saying, this is not life-giving, this is not helpful, how do I turn this around? <laughs> but the vision of home as a safe place to flourish, to grow fully into healthy persons has to, to be, um, has been lost in the busyness, in distractionness, and the brokenness of our culture as well. Do we and will we get it right every time? Nope. But it's as we are more intentional with our actions that we get closer to this idea of a life-giving home. And I think home should be the place where God and commitment to his persons are passed down from generation to generation not just in the family home, but in the church 
family as well. So I've come up with some practical uh, values and ideas of how to create a life-giving space. And it's not exhaustive, but it's just to get, um, get in minds thinking as well. But the first value is connect. Sally Clarkson in her book states, so many of us have been accustomed to growing up without a physical local community of friends with whom we can share life every day and who hold us accountable. And how true is this statement? And it actually, when I read it, it reminded me of what Will was speaking about last week, about um, isolation and solitude, that when we get into that place of overwhelm or being tired, that we can isolate ourselves, and that's what the enemy wants, but that's not what God wants us for. He wants us to be in that place of community, that place um, together for accountability as well. But it's through this connection that we can see the love of God coming through as well, that we are designed for connection with each other and we need each other to be able to share life with. Um, I've thought of some personal examples in our home for connection and one is simply we walk the dog together, we see different things, we appreciate the sunset. We also listen um, to audio books. We get quite involved um, in the story, in the plot line, in the ups and the downs and audio books is my way of not having to fumble over words that I can sit and listen to the story as well. So what works for you guys? Watching Lego Masters together, except for this week when we um, may have skipped ahead without Will, but that's okay, right? <laughs> but creating a space for conversations. You know, some of our interesting, most interesting conversations um, are at our dinner table. Um, but you know what? And maybe it's creating that space at the dinner table or at other times, that it's tech-free zones, that there is no phone, that there is no um, iPad, but so that these con conversations can be intentionally built. Creating a space for the open conversations, for people to be able to share their ideas and their thoughts as well. But even recently, Levi asked, what do families do if they don't say grace at dinner time? And so, and it's just something that saying grace is a, is a habit at dinner that we've actually, that we've just always done. We grew up with it and so we've just passed it on to our kids as well. Um, devotions together, praying together. You know what? It feels weird and awkward to pray out aloud if you've not done it before. And I know that it has for the kids as well. But it's, it's creating those habits and it's a great way to create life-giving space. Um, and even recently, I was actually speaking to someone this week after um, Will's message last week, and the biggest re one of the biggest revelations that they had last week was that they, um, they wanted to create a space in their home that after dinner, that each person doesn't go to their bedroom and do separate things and to, um, to isolate from one another, but she wants to create a space, um, you know, within their home that they can do intentionally carve out time together as a family, that whether that's board games or chatting, just being together and doing life together. You know what? And that's not going to happen on its own. You know what? Then it's going to need intentional adjusting the habit that has been created that to go separate ways, um, adjusting it to be a life-giving habit as well. But what is something that you could adjust within your own home to create life-giving space? You know, another great example of life-giving, of creating um, connection within the broader community, as Glenda was talking about before, is actually of Glenda. I know during the holidays, she actually invites the neighbour kids to come and cook with her. Um, and that's only one thing that I know. Like, she is inviting people into her space and being able to show them the love of God. You know what? Even within Connect Church, we know connection is vital. Um, and on Sunday morning, there are so many of you guys who are contributing and serving within the church to allow the church um, service to run smoothly so that we're creating a space not only for connection with each other but a connection with God as well, that connection point. Connect groups is a great uh, connection point or picnic in the paddock as well. You know what? We've created that space so that church members um, but can invite friends and family to a, to a safe place, to an environment that includes fun, just to get to know each other that little bit better. And you know what? I actually also just want to share a few more um, examples that I've seen, but 
at the, even at the last picnic that we held, I saw that Rachel was playing um, goalie. And while she was playing, she was actually helping and passing the ball to Alyssa um, and allowing her to be involved in the game too. And I just love that our, our young kids have the youth kids to be able to have a great role model too. It's so in the connection, like Rob Dunn fixing Vicky's car on, her day, on his day off, Mara helping Louise at the garage sale, the boys helping Liam move. You know what, when we stop to look, we can see so many life-giving moments within our church, within our family. And sometimes that's what we need to do is actually to stop and to um, just see it as well. But how can you create points of connection to become closer as a life-giving family? What about your person as life-giving? Are you smiling? Are you approachable? Um, My second value that I want to talk on is protect. So life-giving families protect. Protect what is important. Protect time together as a family. Protect each other. You know what? Protecting those habits that you're starting to create is vital. That life-giving habits that you do build into your home. And you know, so we've recently had um, pest control done at our house, but before we had cockroaches. Um, and I have to say, Levi was a very good brother, and he protected his sister. Abby would scream, and every time she would ske- scream, she would cu- he would come running with his shoe to come um, and just squash the cockroach. You knew you knew what was going to happen next. You know what? Building a life-giving home by death to cockroaches. But <laughs> but legit, how can we protect? in a life-giving family and in the church family. 1 Thessalonians says to encourage and build one another up. You know what? Be sure not to engage with destructive behaviour like gossiping and pulling each other down. Let's be a life-giving church that is good for one another, that, is, um, that cheers another on. You know what? Like that saying, be the, w- be the woman who fixes another's crown without telling the world that it is crooked. You know what? I know there's been times that Shona has covered me when I've missed something, when I've forgotten something, and she's just picked it up and done it without making a big deal about it. You know what? What can you see that needs to be done that someone else might have missed? How can you encourage? And people need to hear life-giving words because certainly in our world there seems to be so many negative voices in our world. You know what? And sometimes in encouraging one another, in protecting one another, we need to challenge one another as well. You know, challenge to do better. Challenge to be a better person, to grow in an area. Life-giving families protect each other. Now, for the third, uh, a third value, I couldn't find another word that rhymed with connect or protect. protect. So we went with fun. <laughs> so, um, you know what? Having fun and celebrating is so important. And it's actually one of the things that our personal family, we never used to be so great at, but I feel like we're doing so much better at this. But you know what? Raising a family, going through life can be tough. And I believe it's so important to make sure that we stop and we celebrate those moments in life, the small things as well. You know, whether that's taking the kids for ice cream for end of term, celebrating their birthdays with the meal of their choice, creating memories of fun and a joy, um, that it's outside of the everyday tasks. And it doesn't have to be an expensive thing like roasting marshmallows or having a special dessert together, twirling sparklers at night. Maybe it's a shared joke together which in our family usually comes at my expense a little bit, but you know what, <laughs> like the running joke that I need to watch out for bins, otherwise I'll end up with another bruise on my arm. Like <laughs> sharing those moments together. And one actual, um, something else I wanted to share, a practical thing that I've done is I've actually set up a Wazzle fund. Oh, for those who don't know, Wazzles is our family, our family name because... Smith is too common, but <laughs> if I call out Wazzles, um, but we have the Wazzles Fund, and it's actually, I set aside money each week that um, goes towards an, an adventure fund, so if there is something that comes up, um, if there is something that um, is that bit more expensive, I don't have to stress to go, ooh, I wasn't expecting to spend that money this week, but it's, a, it's just an ease thing as well, and it's so inspiring special and important within the church family to have fun as well. 
whether that's sharing your testimony so that we can celebrate with you, sharing answered prayers with one another, and that will, that will encourage others as well. You know, next week is a great example of celebrating together as we celebrate Mother's Day, not only biological mums, but all of the women within, uh, within our community because you all the women are building and raising that next generation. How can you bring a life-giving spirit by celebrating well? Maybe it's an encouraging text or a phone call to say good job. Maybe it's a meat of dinosaur balloon that says you're rawsome. You know what? Life-giving families have fun and they celebrate together. And you know what? That's only just a few ideas within that, to connect, protect, and to have fun. Uh, but as we move back to the Bible, I want to actually just de- dig in a bit deeper to that life-giving. If we go to the New Testament in Acts 17, 24 to 28, we can read what Paul was speaking uh, to the people in Athens. So verse 24, it says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does, n- does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in histories and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. You know what, that verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, also relates back to Job 12.10, in which Job states that in his hand is the life of every creature, the breath of all mankind. And we can actually read in Genesis um, chapter 2, verse 7, how God created, how, how God gave Adam life. In verse 7 it says, Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Do you notice that these couple of passages, they talk about life and breath. Even in Genesis, when God created man, there were two steps to creating Adam, from the dust and breathing life into him. Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. A scripture God has had on my heart um, a lot lately, and it also fits with life-giving. Ezekiel Ezekiel 37 speaks about the valley of dry bones, um, the way the Lord asked Ezekiel to prophesy life into. If we start off in... um, You can read that all in Ezekiel 37, but I just want to start off in verse 7 this morning. Um, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded and the breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. I believe we need to be aware and conscious not to get sucked down the rabbit hole of just marking off days, of entering entering into things that aren't life-giving, that like these bones in the valley, they looked all together. They had the tendons, they had the skin, and they looked alive, right? And you know what? There's a miracle in that bone and bone coming together, that tendon and flesh and that skin covering those bones. Yet I believe there's more. And you know what? There's been times that I've said to myself that life has just taken me wherever it's felt like it's ta- wanted to. I've been just pretty much marking off another day. And I believe there's some of you here that feels the same way as well, that you're going about life on autopilot, that you feel your life has been taken, um, has just taken you where it's wanted to, whether that's by a choice um, of your own or some of another or simply not making a choice at all. But as Will was saying last week, the enemy wants to try to isolate us, that when we're overwhelmed or tired, that perhaps when we're at our weakness, 
What is it that we turn to during those times? Perhaps the tunnel of social media, a comparison, Netflix, alcohol, gambling, entertainment, excess food. I don't think that God wants us just to have this life, just to be here, just to go about our days on autopilot. I believe God wants more for your life. He wants us to live this life well. And so the meaning of breath of life is actually a thing that someone or something depends on. We need breath to live, right? But the breath of life is not just a thing. It is a person. It's Holy Spirit. And the Hebrew word um, in this passage here for breath is ruach, meaning the breath, the spirit. If we read on from that passage from verse 11, it says, He said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to him, say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says, My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and I will live and I will settle you in the land and then you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it. And we can also read in John 20, 20, 22, um, just after Jesus rose from the grave and appeared to the disciples, um, it says, uh, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said receive the holy spirit you know what we've got same access to the holy spirit as the disciples do um and even as rob was talking this morning about that god is the source of all life we have access to that source let's tap into that source let's use that well um but how much more powerful is it to have the breath of life within us to walk out this life with the Holy Spirit. As we inhale the breath of life, the breath of God, we exhale that breath of life, the love of Christ out. What goes in comes out also. Um, And I want Will to pray in a moment as well, but you know what? God wants to breathe his breath of life into your soul, into your life. Those bones that have felt dried, the hope that's felt or gone. God wants to put his spirit into you to live. He wants breath to enter you and for you to rise as a mighty army, rise together as a life-giving family. And we need to be filled with that breath of life so that we're not just standing there, but we have that life and we can give that life to others as well. Because if we're feeling that we are dried up and have no hope, there's others in our community as well. But I believe um, the key to living this life well and making sure that we don't go about life on autopilot is that that breath of life that flows th- throws, flows to us and through us, the breath of the Holy Spirit that allows us to stand as an army, fully alive as life-giving people, creating homes, churches, families, spaces, us as life-giving people and welcoming a space for others to flourish as well. So good, hey? Now, like this week, I, got, uh, I had a really powerful time getting to hang out with my, my grandpa. For those of you that know, he's um, late-stage cancer at the moment. And so I got to spend the week in Mackay hanging out with him and, uh, and praying with him. And I've, I've realized this week that my, my dad isn't yet... Uh, one that calls on the name of Jesus Christ. And there was something so powerful about spending that time together, of being able to pray together, of having him open the word to me. And there was something that happens in osmosis. And recently, Leisha and I were at a a prayer retreat, and and there was just someone there that has such a father's heart. And as he was praying over me and speaking over me, something came alive in me, and I realized the power of this breath. The power of breathing this in. You know, God in his wholeness, he breathed inside of us. And so this morning, you know, God's put it on our hearts. You know, Glenda was talking about how the church has got its eyes closed. You know what? We're a family. And here is the, as the head parents, Alicia and I, we want to breathe into you this morning. We want to bring that life. We want to prophesy into your world this morning 
into these life spaces. And as I look around this morning, I can see on so many faces the hurt that is encountered in family itself. That there is fissures and dysfunction inside of families here. And and talking about life-giving family this morning is more painful than helpful. But I want to breathe. We're going to pray with you this morning. And if if you're here today and you are like, you know what? I have got frustration in my family. The kids aren't walking with Jesus. Or there's there's fighting and there's, there's disconnect. There's isolation. There's things that are going on. We're going to stand with you this morning and we are going to breathe and we're going to prophesy and we're going to speak the word of God into those spaces. There's people here this morning, as Glenda said, that have been hurt and wounded by the church. And this morning, as the parents of the church, we are humbly asking for your forgiveness, where that might have been here or another house, where you have been wounded, where you have been hurt, where people in the church have fought and it has hurt you. And this morning, we are going to prophesy and we are going to pray and we're going to see God breathe life into that space because you know what we are called as a community to be life-giving do you believe that this morning connect do you know there's life that God has in of himself and when he breathed into you that life is now yours you know what we've got a responsibility here to uphold this church and to bring that I want to be like my granddad was to me this week I just want to stand with you. I want to pray with you. I want to believe with you. So why don't you stand right now? Alicia and I, we're going to pray. But if there's something particular, if there's something specific, if you have schism, if you have division, if you have stuff that is broken and divided this morning and you have faith that God wants to move it, I'm going to stand with you in faith and we're going to breathe and prophesy today. We're going to stand upon that this morning. And if you've got faith to stand with people, I want you to come and stand behind as as people do come out. I want you to stand. I want you to just to pray. I'm not asking you to give them a word or anything, but just stand and pray. Just pray and believe that if God's giving you a space of wholeness at the moment, you minister out of that wholeness. And we see, we see, that revitalized power of God come into our lives so that we can go and minister into a broken community. My God, this morning, we pray, we pray, breathe, Holy Spirit, your breath of life upon us. Bring about wholeness. Bring about life-givingness inside of us. My God, into this family, into this church this morning, breathe, my God. Where there has been dry bones, where there has been death, where there has been division and brokenness, we speak life in the name of Jesus today. I thank you for bringing together in a way that only your spirit can. As your children, as we come together underneath Father God, Lord, give us the ability to play well together. Give us the ability to have incredible unity as family to minister because the world will know our love for you when they see our love for one another. My God, breathe upon this place. May there be a life-giving substance that comes out of here like as never before, my God. I pray for your restoration and wholeness power here in this church, here in the churches of Caboolture, here in this region. We, my God, bring revival here in this place. Lord, bring about great healing into the hearts of the young people in the schools. Lord, bring them and call them unto yourself. Holy Father, Lord, we speak life into those that are struggling in family right now. Those that have been hurt and burnt by divorce or brokenness, separation. Those that are in marriage right now that are hurting and are broken, my God. Holy Spirit, life, come and breathe upon right now. Come and move in a way that is not wisdom of man, but is spirit of God. That is power. That is power. That is power. We declare life in the name of Jesus today. Hallelujah. Chris, can you have the chap on the on the guitar? You know, the first place to start in life is to say yes to Jesus. One of the most incredible things I've seen this week is, is just with my granddad while he was spending time with a carer in a couple of hours, had a girl in tears as she was reading the word to him and he was opening it to her. She said, I can't believe this, this is exactly what is happening in my life right now. Jesus is speaking to me. I can't believe he's speaking to me. And you know what? He's speaking to you today. Leisha was reading scripture and she was speaking from her heart, but it wasn't the words that she was saying, but the Spirit of God is speaking to you today. And the first thing to do is to say yes to Jesus. You could be someone that has been in church one time, 101 times, 1,001 times, and you can allow scales to grow of your eyes and become blind. He wants to give you freedom and sight today. And 
Freedom is a choice. Freedom is a choice. The first choice is to say yes to Jesus. Would you say yes to Jesus today? The first time, the tenth time, the hundredth time, the thousandth time. It's a decision. Come on, Lord God, move across this place right now. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us right now, that we would expel every root of bitterness that rises up in us. Word says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We miss the mark. But Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus, your blood shed has cleared has cleared every charge against me, every sin, every missed mark is broken. Whether you've said yes to Jesus before or maybe today's your first time, I'm asking you right now, would you say yes to him? We're going to pray right now. We're all going to pray together because this is family. I need a little bit more Jesus in my life. I'm sure I'm not alone here. And after that, I'm going to invite people to come up the front if you have need of ministry this morning, if you want if you want us just to stand with you and prophesy, if you believe that God's got more in your life, and um, yeah, specifically, just, just while we were talking about that then, I've got, a, I've got a couple. If you don't come up here, I'll call you out. So if God's moving on your heart this morning, uh, make sure you, you, you come out here because I know that there's people here that are like, there's more, there's more, there's more, and there's, there's something, there's a release this morning in, in the prophetic. There's a release this morning as we speak, not, not because we're awesome, just because we're parents here, just because we're the, we're the leaders of this church, we're the parents, and there's something that God has brought today that is going to bring release, okay? So if God's moving on your heart to see about a greater breakthrough, I'm going to ask you to come up the front. The first step is not anything anyone can do but God alone, and that's where we just respond to Jesus Christ. So would you pray with me this morning? After I pray, would you repeat it? Heavenly Father, thank you for your great love. Jesus, I need you. I can't do this on my own. Forgive me. Heal me. Bring me into your family. Make me yours. I ask today, you would come into my life and clean me and take me into your life that I would live victorious, that I would be more than an overcomer, that I would be the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Free me today. Call me out of the grave. And give me life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, Jesus today, move upon this place. Jesus, today, move upon our lives. Jesus, today, we need you more. God, where there is stoppage, where there is blockage, where there is broken, where there is hurt, freedom in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. My God, we need you. Lord, make us the victory so that we can see victory in this community in Jesus' name. Right now, right now, if you are experiencing brokenness in any Area, I want you to start to come out the front. Um, I just want to pray for restoration as well. Restoration um, personally for those who feel like your hope is also that is dried up, just personally, not even and in your family as well. But I want to pray for restoration and for that life giving power as well. Lord, I thank you, Father, for your restoration to come upon each and every one of us right now, whatever area that is broken, whatever area that we are lacking in, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you're a good God and you give good gifts. And I just ask and I just declare for restoration over relationships, restoration over um, families, restoration over just um, extended families as well, restoration uh, within churches as well, Lord. I thank you, Father, for... Um, for your spirit of unity. 
Lord, I thank you, Father, for those who feel their hope has dried up, Father, that they're, it's just, there's, they're just marking off a day, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you'll give them a new hope inside, Father, that you'll breathe new life into them, Father, that your Holy Spirit will just come into them, Father, and just they'll be able to inhale you to be able to exhale you out as well, Lord. I thank you for your life-giving power, life-giving thoughts, life-giving mindsets to come on people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen.